In 2014, the world lost one of the most inspiring personalities in cinema. Terrible news of the death of Robin Williams. The animated comic genius and personal idol of my childhood. Good morning, Vietnam! Hey, this is not his boundless positivity. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. And his ability to lighten any mood made him a friend to all of us. And yet, something crept upon Robin Williams like a toxic shadow, consuming all of his light. Something more disturbing than old habits. Soon formed an addiction to cocaine and alcohol. Something that would come to define his final moments. He had what's known as Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia. Lewy That's body dementia. A form of dementia that has received little public focus until now. Robin Williams' wife, Susan Schneider, recalls the year before his diagnosis, he'd been struggling with an odd constellation of symptoms. There are over 40 symptoms for LBD, and Robin had nearly all of them. Um, symptoms you'd never have thought could have led to his eventual suicide a year later. Constipation, urinary urgency, GERD, trouble sleeping. Symptoms that were not entirely surprising for an older gentleman with an active lifestyle, a guy with a high amount of stress, but also loss of smell and sudden significant difficulty maintaining attention. It was during the filming of Night at the Museum 3 that Robin Williams noticeably struggled with his lines. And action! 1895 H&H &H Magnum Elephant Gun. Turns out they have a rather nice collection here. He was becoming more forgetful and frustrated with it. It can be confusing at first. In fact, it was so out of the ordinary for Williams that he'd suffered a panic attack, which led his PCP to prescribe him an antipsychotic which we've already discussed can be bad for elderly patients with dementia, episode 151. Not to mention, antipsychotics can be devastating for some patients with Lewy body dementia, as they antagonize an already depleted dopaminergic system. And that's the focus of our program this week. Welcome back to Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine, and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. I'm Jim Siegler, and today on the podcast, Lewy body dementia the diagnostic criteria, and clinical management of this atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. Stay with us. Hey, podcast listeners. If you're a neurology resident and you plan on taking your boards this summer, you're probably asking yourself, how should I prepare? Well, you can start by checking out the annual Penn Neurology Board Review course now in its 17th year. This high-yield course offers a broad range of online content, live in-person or teleconference discussions, and optional mock exams with up to 1,400 questions. If you're worried about COVID-19, the course offers more than 40 hours of video-based lectures and live streaming of the two days of case-based discussions, all featuring experts in the field. And if you're recertifying, you're also eligible for CME credit. So take a look at all that the Penn Neurology Board Review course has to offer by clicking the link in the episode show notes or just Google Penn Neurology Board Review course. Brainwaves listeners even get a special discount on the in-person and online content. Just use the promo code WAVES2020 at checkout. That's WAVES in all caps 2020. For this week's program, I spoke with Dr. Amy Culture online via Skype. I'm Amy Culture. I'm a movement disorder specialist. At Cooper University Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. I am the director of the movement disorders division. And she's been treating patients with Lewy body dementia and other movement disorders for a while. Over 25 years doing clinical trials and um, seeing patients in the office. And I'd asked her to join because she'd just given a fantastic grand rounds on Louis body dementia at Cooper just a few weeks earlier. Thank you. By the way, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate you coming on and, and taking the time to do this. This is it's fun. Yeah. Getting me technologically more savvy than I was for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and in this day and age, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, it's paying off to be technically savvy, whether it's recording podcast interviews remotely or if you're just getting into telemedicine for the first time. I have not yet figured out how to go about evaluating new patients when I can't meet them face to face. Because the doctor-patient relationship is really important to me in terms of managing patients with movement disorders because they're in it for the long haul. 
and there has to be some trust of the patient and the patient of me. And I feel like that is hard to develop if you are not in the same room with a patient at least a few times. I totally agree. I I remember when I was... For better or worse, the whole concept of telemedicine is one that we're going to have to get behind. It's hard for doctors like Amy Coulter, who are forced into difficult situations with patients who frequently have cognitive impairment and they can't figure out blue jeans or WebEx or whatever other software hospitals are using for tele-encounters. It's hard for providers like Dr. Coulter to establish a good rapport with patients and their families in order to enact a durable care plan. The continuity of care was really important to me from the beginning. So I knew that that would be part of my job And I think the idea of sort of taking care of the whole person and their family is something that I have have always wanted to do. While any of this surge in telemedical care would be hard for doctors like Dr. Coulter to adapt to, I can't say that it's all that easy for anybody else out there. Take my friend Ali Hamidani, for example. So, and in normal vestibular function, the eyes maintain fixation. A neuro-ophthalmologist. Turn the head towards the side. How can he do telemedicine when most of his assessments rely on slit lamp and the fundus exam? What about Olga Tone, who you've also heard on the podcast before? On this first visit, we're going to talk about what is multiple sclerosis. How is Dr. Tone supposed to assess whether a patient's spasticity is worsening over the phone? need more diagnostic evaluation. I think we're all kind of struggling through this shifting paradigm in medical care. But as it becomes more commonplace and more accepted by patients and providers, we'll definitely settle into this new norm. All right, so let's get on to the topic at hand. So, uh, you know, when I think about the movement disorders, usually I think about idiopathic Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism, and then I kind of branch out from there. Is it idiopathic? Is it secondary to medications, or is it some other synucleinopathy or tauopathy? And for me, it's difficult early on to distinguish idiopathic PD from these other types of Parkinsonisms. What tilts the needle for you in thinking that this patient may have Lewy body dementia or cortical basal degeneration or some other Parkinsonian syndrome? I think in general, the presenting symptom is the thing that seals it for me, that Most patients are in my office after they have had symptoms for a while. The Um, median delay from symptom onset to diagnosis of Lewy body dementia can be close to 18 months for some patients. Um, So making them go back and tell me what happened first before the, the sort of stiffness and slowness that is what makes them think that they have Parkinson's disease is helpful because the patients with Lewy body dementia are going to have cognitive symptoms or psychosis before they develop Parkinsonism. So one of the diagnostic criteria for Lewy body dementia is that that needs to have happened at least a year before the Parkinsonism starts. Historically, dementia in the first year of Parkinsonism was an exclusion criteria for the diagnosis of idiopathic PD. But in 2015, the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society rescinded that one-year rule, Now it's kind of a rule of thumb. And cognitive symptoms within the first year of PD can be classified as, quote, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy body's subtype, which can be clinically similar to dementia with Lewy bodies. And for this reason, some may use Lewy body dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies interchangeably. But Lewy body dementia is the term that's now being used to encompass both dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. I think it's Lewy body dementia is the most common thing that people call it. That said, the Lewy Body Dementia Association Scientific Advisory Council insists that the two conditions be considered separately because DLB may not demonstrate Parkinsonian features in 50-70% to of patients, among other reasons. And to complicate matters, Lewy Body Dementia is a term to be distinguished from Lewy Body Disease, which is a histopathologic diagnosis made at autopsy or by brain biopsy, in which there are neuronal alpha-synuclein inclusions, which may or may not have been preceded by any neurologic symptoms whatsoever. So for the podcast, we're going to be using the term Lewy body dementia. Anyway, like Dr. Coulter said, the Parkinsonism in Lewy body dementia tends to occur later and is typically milder than the other cognitive symptoms that the patient will experience. Um, the patients with cortical basal syndrome, they have very asymmetric rigidity. So one extremity is 
so rigid out of proportion to the rest of their body. So it's more clear when you're in the office with them that this is not typical Parkinson's because in the amount of time they've had the disease, they wouldn't be that stiff if it was garden variety Parkinson's disease. Then there's multiple system atrophy, another synucleinopathy, which may be differentiated by the presence of early gait instability, dysarthria, and ataxia, although it is remarkably similar to idiopathic PD. And finally, there's PSP, which is a tauopathy, a condition that's poorly responsive to levodopa, and is characterized by more frequent falls and vertical gaze palsy. But Lewy body dementia, for a condition that you might not have thought to be so common, it's actually the second most common neuropathologic cause of dementia behind Alzheimer's disease, accounting for 5 to 30% of all cases of dementia, depending on which study you're citing. Typically, the patient has some kind of psychosis and some kind of cognitive impairment that is making it impossible for them to do their their job anymore or to function the way they used to function. They have to give up driving. So this is a whole issue with the family. If they had been the one that was doing most of the driving or if they had been responsible for different household activities that they have to give them up. As time goes on, the interesting thing about Lewy body dementia is one of the one of the characteristics of Lewy body dementia is this sort of fluctuation in mental status. Um, so that sometimes the patient can seem fine, and then other times they're really hallucinating, or they have periods where they're just staring into space and they're unresponsive. So trying to educate the family that this is part of the disease and they're not having a seizure and they're not having a stroke and you don't have to rush them to the emergency room every time that happens is is challenging. Can you elaborate more on that? Because I do think it's so hard for us, at least from my experience on the hospital side, to distinguish a seizure or a stroke. I mean, these patients tend to be a little bit older and they are at risk of these comorbid neurologic conditions. How do you know that it's one of the typical kind of spells of dementia with Lewy bodies? I think um, the fact that it it happens, I guess, more frequently, there's no associated symptoms that you would see with a seizure. Like when they come out of it, they're not confused. They don't have incontinence. They don't have tongue biting. There's no motor movement that goes with it. And there's no focal neurologic deficit other than a sort of spaciness, I would say. How long do they typically last? It can be a half an hour. It can be an hour, which makes the family really nervous, but that's way longer than a seizure would be, for example. Mm -hmm. So, and it is hard. Sometimes I will order an EEG just to put everybody's mind at rest. But once that's done and it doesn't show any epileptiform discharges, then I'm not going to keep ordering it and keep going down that path. Let's break here for a minute to review the 2017 Dementia with Lewy Body Diagnostic Criteria, which are probably more important for research purposes and clinical trials. The clinical criteria are important in terms of recruiting for clinical trials because there are some areas of overlap in the dementias and you don't want to be recruiting somebody with Alzheimer's disease. And again, these criteria are distinct from the criteria that we use to diagnose Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia which is a term that's preferentially used to describe the dementia that occurs in a person who has well-established Parkinson's disease. Dementia with Lewy bodies, on the other hand, includes dementia as an essential element in the diagnosis, with such significant impairment as to interfere with the activities of daily living. So these patients are typically older, typically in their 70s, where they're starting to get cognitive difficulties. Memory impairment is a later feature, while deficits in attention, executive function, and visuospatial abilities like copying a figure, solving a puzzle, or size matching. These are very common early on. The patients with Lewy body dementia typically have more executive dysfunction and spatial dysfunction than the people with, say, Alzheimer's disease. The core criteria for dementia with Lewy bodies, for which you must have two in order to diagnose probable DLB, or at least one criterion with one or more biomarkers like an abnormal DAT scan or a polysomnogram demonstrating REM sleep without atonia. These core criteria include fluctuating cognition, fluctuating level of consciousness, recurrent well-formed visual disturbances, hallucinations, Parkinsonism, 
And lastly, REM sleep behavior disorder. REM behavior disorder. Which can precede the cognitive symptoms. Even years prior to the diagnosis of, of Lewy body dementia or any Parkinsonian syndrome. Then there are supportive criteria, which aren't used to define probable DLB or possible DLB, but they may be useful in the clinical setting. Features like sensitivity to neuroleptics, postural instability, falls, syncope or episodic unresponsiveness, dysautonomia, hyposmia, delusions, and anxiety or depression. So to reiterate, probable DLB requires at minimum dementia, as well as two of the core criteria, fluctuating attention, hallucinations, RBD, Parkinsonism, or at least one of these two core criteria with a supporting biomarker, which not many movement specialists will test for, to be honest. I don't typically do a DAT scan for people that I suspect have Lewy body dementia because if they have Parkinsonism, it's going to be abnormal. And the DAT scan tells you that you have a dopamine deficiency. It doesn't help to differentiate between regular Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease with dementia, Lewy body dementia, or corticobasal syndrome, multiple system atrophy. So I don't typically order that. An MRI sometimes can be helpful because the pattern of atrophy differentiating Lewy body dementia from Alzheimer's disease, you see more posterior atrophy, more occipital parietal atrophy in Lewy body dementia, and more temporal atrophy or global atrophy in Alzheimer's disease. And other studies, like myocardial scintigraphy, which can be used as a supportive biomarker, are not readily available at most centers, so they're not typically done either. But a polysonogram for a patient with sleep disturbance is reasonable. To distinguish these clinical criteria and the diagnostic criteria from those that define Parkinson's disease dementia, the other half of the Lewy body dementia construct, I'd encourage you to read the excellent 2019 review by Melissa Armstrong in Continuum. So you've made the diagnosis, or at least you have a reasonable suspicion for Lewy body dementia. What are we able to do for these patients? Um, what can we fix? Cognitive issues, mood issues, mobility issues, support. If they're, if they're unstable, are they safe at home? Do they need somebody with them all the time? Do we need to reassess their living environment? I, I think I, I address all of those questions at whether they have idiopathic Parkinson's or whether they have another Parkinsonian syndrome. But the need for social work and psychiatry may be more in some of the patients with other syndromes. We've mentioned that a hallmark for Lewy body dementia is the cognitive impairment, with many patients suffering from difficulty maintaining attention and with executive function, as opposed to memory and naming impairment, which we see in Alzheimer's disease, for example. These patients also suffer from significant anxiety, depression, and delusions, as well as the visual hallucinations that we're all used to hearing about. And these chronic progressive symptoms can be as much of a burden on the patient as they can be on their caregivers. And also providing support groups for the patients and families so that they feel like they're not so alone in their journey with this. So the early recognition of these non-motor and cognitive symptoms by caregivers is as much a goal of therapy as getting the right prescription for occupational therapy and physical therapy. When I give somebody a prescription for physical therapy or speech therapy, I also give them a list of local providers that have expertise in Parkinsonism so that they're not sent to just the general physical therapist who would work on somebody after they've had a knee replacement, for example. While these non-pharmacologic strategies are a multidisciplinary mainstay in the management of Lewy body dementia, we should acknowledge a few medications that play a role in this disease. Obviously, each medication needs to be weighed in the context of the severity of the symptom it's targeting and the side effect profile. Antidepressants for the one-third of patients who have clinical depression, melatonin to improve quality of sleep, stool softeners for constipation, these are all excellent therapies to consider. Targeted therapeutics include the cholinesterase inhibitors denepazil and rivastigmine, Rivastigmine is the best cholinergic medicine to use. But both rivastigmine and denepazil have been shown in randomized clinical trials to improve the activities of daily living for patients who have Lewy body dementia, and they also relieve caregiver burden. Rivastigmine has the advantage of coming in a transdermal patch rather than a pill. 
Measures of cognitive performance also show improvement with cholinesterase inhibitor use. And at this point, this class of therapies remains the only option for treating cognitive impairment. The NMDA receptor antagonist memantine, which we use commonly in Alzheimer's disease, has shown inconsistent results in the treatment of cognitive impairment that's related to Lewy body dementia, especially when it's added to the cholinesterase inhibitor. Um, the jury is sort of out on the addition of memantine to that to try and help with the cognitive deficits. Regarding the hallucinations and the psychosis, only one drug has received an FDA indication for psychosis that's associated with Parkinson's disease, Nuplazid. Describing Nuplazid, the only FDA-approved medicine proven to significantly reduce hallucinations and delusions related to Parkinson's. Don't take Nuplazid, also called Pimavanserin. Which works on the serotonin system, not on the dopamine system at all, uh, because these patients are typically very sensitive to neuroleptics. So you get put them on something like, like Respiradol, or even those atypical dopamine blockers. They can make their cognitive symptoms worse. They can make their psychosis worse. So On that thought, in addition to thinking about the drugs you can use to manage symptoms of Lewy body dementia, the avoidance of certain drugs should be stressed. Antidopaminergics, antipsychotics, for example, these should be used with caution for the treatment of hallucinations. But sometimes you can't avoid these options. Primavanserin, in my experience, doesn't work so well if the hallucinations are really severe. Um, it works for mild hallucinations. So then second-line therapy, a lot of people use quetiapine to try and treat the hallucinations just because its side effect profile is preferable to clozapine which can cause a granulocytosis in 1-2% to 2 of patients, and it requires frequent CBCs. Uh, the problem with treating the Parkinsonism is that any dopaminergic medicine that you use to treat the motor symptoms has the potential to worsen the psychosis. So it's a balancing act between how important mobility is versus cognition. Like Dr. Coulter said, Quetiapine and clozapine appear to have the best safety profile for Parkinsonism. The reason being, among the antidopaminergics at least, there is virtually zero risk of extrapyramidal side effects with these medications. I haven't seen quetiapine really worsen motor symptoms. So, and according to published systematic reviews, we also see that, although the data are better for clozapine. The advantage of clozapine may be due to the differential antagonism of serotonergic 5-HT2 receptors, as well as the norepinephrine receptors in the central nervous system when compared to antipsychotics. But it's limited by its hematologic side effect profile, as we've discussed. And for the management of motor symptoms, bradykinesia, the stiffness, we've also got to remain cautious so as not to tip the balance and worsen the psychosis. I would stick with just uh, levodopa preparations to manage the motor symptoms and stay away from the dopamine agonists and other medicines. Other medications to be cautious with would be caffeine, as it could worsen insomnia, and then anticholinergics, which should probably be avoided in any geriatric population. Typically staying away from anticholinergics, so if you're trying to treat depression or anxiety using SSRIs, maybe more than a tricyclic. The treatment of these patients is very, very challenging. Paranoia. Insomnia. Horrible insomnia. Delusions. I don't know about Parkinsonian symptoms. Depression. It's not your fault. That was so difficult to quell. The drug's not working. And I think it's very hard on the family because the patient becomes someone that they were not. I'm not who you think I am. Yeah, no shit. Watch your mouth, young man. So I think it's crucial that care providers really are cognizant of the effect that this has on everyone. Tomorrow, a chance of continued crappy with a pissy weather front coming down from the north. It was, it was torturous, you know? To make sure that they will provide adequate support for the, the family as well as the patient. Caring for them, listening to them, applying a cold cloth until a fever breaks. Because we are members of the human race. If we're going to fight a disease, let's fight one of the most terrible diseases of all, indifference. These are the things that matter. And that's all we got for the program this week. Thanks so much for tuning in. 
Special thanks to Dr. Amy Coulter of Cooper University Hospital for sharing her experience managing Lewy body dementia. And as always, this program is intended for medical education only, not to be used for clinical decision making. The episode this week was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, with the help of Amy Coulter out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia. Music for this program was courtesy of Andrew Sacco, Axel Tree, Damiano Baldoni, Josh Woodward, and Julian Maxwell. Our theme song was by Jimothy Dalton. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeone. And if you're taking your neurology board exam this summer, I strongly recommend you check out the Penn Neurology Board Review course, which I took in preparation for my licensing exam, and I thought it was an excellent way to prepare. Even if you don't live in Philadelphia, you can still access the wealth of the online content, the pre-recorded lectures, and an optional mock exam. Using the promo code WAVES2020, you'll even get a discount at checkout. So take a look at the link to the registration in the show notes of our program. I'm Jim Siegler. Talk to you again soon.